Welcome to Outside Ourselves. I'm your host, Kelsey Clumbera. Today, I'm chatting with singer and songwriter Andy Gullahorn about his music, his songwriting process, and the importance of honesty, humor, and grace within his music. We talk a little bit about the Christian music industry in general, as well as the importance of community when it comes to being able to be honest about ourselves and our shortcomings. I think you're really going to like this one. Here's today's episode. Andy, thanks so much for joining me today. I'm, um, I have heard you in, uh, I've heard you live at a few 1517 conferences. Um, the ones of course in Northwest Arkansas, but have not had the chance to talk with you. So I'm excited today to kind of pick your brain about what you do and, um, about your music. So thanks so much for, for joining me today. Thanks for having me. Yeah. As we get started, can you just give us a little intro to yourself? Um, you're a, sing- a singer songwriter. I know you live in Nashville, but I'd love to know a little bit more um, about who you are and what you do. Sure. Yeah, I'm uh, originally from Texas, but I moved to Nashville to go to college. And uh, okay. I moved to Nashville because I loved writing songs. And I thought, uh, you know, I love the songwriters in Nashville and thought I would be able to maybe write songs for other people. And uh, I kind of started doing that after I graduated from college here because I, I married a girl who signed a record deal. So I was writing for her records and playing guitar for her and uh, traveled with her for, well, still am traveling with her. But the first uh, seven years of our marriage is pretty much just being her guitar player and writing for records. And then oh, wow. we started having kids. Oh, her name is Jill Phillips, by the way. Yes. Um, yeah. We started having kids and she wanted to be home more. So then I had no clue what I was going to do with my life and started making my own records and uh, traveling and discovered that over the years that I actually love traveling and playing music for people. I just, hmm. I didn't think I'd want to be the person up front. And I'm, I'm always happy to not be the person up front, but I found that I, I really you kind of like it. I, I love it. Um, yeah. So that's most of my um, my job now. I still write for some other people, but okay. most of my work is traveling around playing my music for people. And the weird thing is, is it's not normal shows, I guess. I, like this year, I've been gone most of the year, but it's playing retreats and conferences and things like that. Okay. Um, yeah. That's interesting. Do you... Um, I mean, you obviously have a deep love for songwriting. Why do you like songwriting versus performing? Why do you like performing versus songwriting? How do the two kind of go hmm. hand in hand? Uh, to me, I love songwriting because personally, it's it's the easiest way for me to connect with my heart. I'm, I generally have a hard time like knowing what I'm feeling or what emotions feel like. I'm, I'm not like an ice man or something, but, uh, you know, whenever I'm in therapy or something I'm like, well, how are you feeling? I'm like, I don't know. Maybe I'm supposed to feel <laughs> a certain way, but it's just hard for me to know. But, um, songwriting has always been a way to kind of tap into how I feel about something like the songs will kind of hmm. help me figure that out. Um, so the songwriting is kind of the most important thing to me as far as hmm. the performing side. If I wasn't, a uh, a songwriter and I was like performing cover songs or something like that, I think I would hate yeah. it. Uh, yeah. the, the reason why I'm playing the songs out for people is because uh, I want to, I hope they connect with other people. And then, mm-hmm. and then doing shows also uh, helps me feel connected uh, to other stories to write more songs about. So mm-hmm. I like writing songs with that's interesting. picturing the audience like, well, what, what would be good to bring to this, event or this city um, or this perceived group of people uh, because I like thinking that songs can change me, can move me from one place to another. Uh, Mm. So I like thinking of how that might serve different communities. Yeah. 
Yeah, man, I relate to what you say. You said about like not knowing exactly how you're feeling and writing being the way you kind of get to that. I because I'm, I feel like I'm similar. I'm not necessarily the person that's. I'm I'm not overly emotional um, on a lot of things, and the way that I end up processing a lot of times is through like either talking it out or or writing it out. Um, so that makes. I think that makes a lot of sense. And I'm sure there's a lot of people that feel similar. Um, you are, I mean, a, a lot of your songs are not overtly Christian, but you are a Christian artist and uh, you are a Christian personally. Why have you kind of decided to to go down that um, route um, as far as, as songwriting goes? Well, I didn't grow up listening to Christian music. Um, and, and I grew up in church, but, uh, not listening to Christian music, I grew yeah. up Catholic and we didn't listen to stuff like that. So, okay. uh, and I'm partly grateful for that. Um, yeah, but I also grew, true. I grew up on country and, and folk music. So when I, and, and the kind of places I play, it might be a Christ, specifically Christian venue or setting, or it might completely not be. So I've always mm -hmm. wanted to write the songs in a language that, that wouldn't um, make somebody feel left out. So, yeah. and I've written for stuff in the Christian music market for a number of years, but the, there's a certain language to it that felt like a foreign language to me. It's not just the way that I normally talk. So yeah. I never felt like I fit in with it. Um, but I love being able to play the same song in a church that I would play like in a regular venue. Um, and people feel like they can connect with it. That doesn't mean that I don't sing mm -hmm. songs about faith or God. I, I think I do a lot. But I think when I do, I'm careful about the language. And yeah. I, I try to write more about, I find that even people that aren't Christians, they can relate to doubts. And um, when you're talking about that kind of a thing, uh, doubts and suffering, they're like, anybody can relate to that. So Right. My goal is is to write in a language that would wouldn't leave anybody out. Yeah, and I hope I didn't I didn't mean to give people the wrong impression because your your music isn't I don't think it's what people uh, tend to necessarily first think of when they think of like Christian music. And I think one reason um, if you if you have a negative connotation with that, maybe I think one of the reasons though that's true is kind of what you're saying. Um, you're writing for everyone. And one of the ways that I think you do that so well is that you have this um, depth of honesty to, there's a depth of honesty to your music um, because you are really good at being honest about yourself mm -hmm. as well as kind of the human condition in general. And that's not always an easy thing to do. And where would you say that ability has come from where you are able to just kind of be honest um, with your audience? I kind of think that um, that's a great question. I was about to answer something. I don't even know if it's true. It's just kind of off the top of my head, <laughs> but um, yeah, go for it. I like to think that the songs are a reflection of what, what my life actually is. And not every songwriter tries to do that. Mm. Like there's, there could be some songwriters that are writing from a persona or whatever. And it's, you yeah. know, they feel like it's okay. separate from who they are. That's not the kind of music that I loved growing up. And it's just not what comes out of me naturally. So mm. I think if the songs feel like they are maybe more vulnerable and honest, um, it's probably a ref a reflection of the way that I've had to learn how to live, like in the community hmm. that I live in. Um, you know, a lot of things help with that, having good community and friends around that I can be open and honest with. And then yeah. uh, a lot of therapy. Um, so the songs are just kind of a continuation of that language. Um, hmm. I like to think that's the case, but um, I, I remember hearing a songwriter one time on an interview, like on NPR years ago, he had a new record coming out and the interviewer asked him, 
what people could learn about him personally through this record. And he was like, nothing. These are just stories. Hmm. I'm just a storyteller. This isn't like a, yeah, yeah. You can't. And, and at first I was like, well, that's not really true. Cause this, even the stories that you choose to tell, if they're other people's stories that says something about what's important to you, but yeah. set that aside. That's when I heard that, I was like, oh, that's not right or wrong, but not, it's like the opposite of what I want to do. I would hope that if people listen mm. to my music, um, they really would have a sense of who I am. And actually the songs yeah. are probably an aspirational version of myself, you know, like, <laughs> uh, hopefully not as aspirational as like an Instagram version of so someone, but, um, <laughs> but I would, th the songs in a way are like, um, either like who I am or who I'm aspiring to be or trying to be. I see that. But I also just see you in a lot of what I've heard being really honest in a way that's um, relatable to people. And I think that maybe gets to kind of what you're saying about how community helps with honesty. Hmm. Cause there's like a, there's a connection between honesty and relatability. I think, um, that also then forces like empathy um, mm -hmm. because if, the more we're able to kind of be like, this is, this is hard or I did this, I messed up. Like, obviously that's the basis for like, you know, what we would say is confession and repentance as Christians. But then I think how it works often with neighbors is it opens up the conversation for people to say, yeah, me too. And even like realize it and acknowledge that they have a certain feeling or something's been difficult. I don't know. Um, do you see, like, have you seen that happen for people um, through either your songs or just um, songs that you would consider as, as really honest? The uh, songs that always moved me growing up, and it's mostly country music and folk music that I listen to, whenever there's something about somebody being kind of specific about the truth of their own life, even if it wasn't something that was specific to my life that made it really easy for me to find myself in that song. And like, and yeah. And those were the kind of songs that, um, the ones I always gravitated to were, were the songs that were kind of like healing agents. It's kind of like reflecting something about your own life through somebody else's mm. story or whatever. And then kind of like not telling you what to do with it, but giving you an example of a, path forward um so those are always the songs mm. that i resonated with and so as a songwriter um i think there are well, maybe more factors but two that come to mind one is like trying to be somewhat specific um hmm. I, I, a, a tendency particular particularly for younger writers is to be like oh i want to write a song that the most number of people will connect with so it has to be the most general song that I can think of. Yeah. Like about love, like, you know, whatever. Yeah. But the things that I actually connect with most are ones that tell like a really specific story of. Yeah. Two people. Um, so, so finding that, that a lot of connection happens through the specificity of it. So that's mm. definitely a, a goal in a lot of the writing. Um, and there was a second uh, point that um, I had, and it was really good. And I don't <laughs> remember what it was. Um, <laughs> if you remember it, we can circle back, yeah, or great. you can take a minute. I might not. I might not ever remember it. Um, but I think. Oh, the other, I do remember. The other You're part. You remember is, it at like three a.m. Yeah, and I'll I'll just text you a voice yeah. message. No, yeah. I, the, the other part was, um, with that background in country and folk music, like I'm kind of a. I love math. So I would, one of the mm. things I loved about those songs is I would just kind of study the song structure. And I, I love the way that this, the simple structure of a song could do some of the, the heavy lifting for the change agent part of the song. I don't know if that makes sense, but, mm. but like okay. how, how you could use, the, I, mean, I mean, it would be like that with any kind of writing. Right. Yeah. Um, but, but there's a certain structure to it that is, uh, I don't see it as like restrictive. I see it as like uh, being kind to the listener. It's an easy mm -hmm. way for them to process information. So, so I would pay attention to song structure 
and also just try to use really simple words. Nobody, I don't think I've ever been accused of using really yeah. big words and being like a, a great poet. Um, <laughs> but I just always like to use, uh, write something the way that I would say it. I want it to be conversational. Mm -hmm. Um, and I'm not saying every song should be that way. I think I've, I just do it that way because maybe I've tried the other ways and I'm not good at it. I don't know, but it's just being comfortable with that. That's just the language that comes out of me. Um, mm. and I hope my hope in using that kind of language is that it would be easy to relate to. Yeah, no, I think that's totally, I, that was something that I, that's something that I've picked up on as well as, as ha is how simple your lyrics are. Um, which you're right. That makes it easy for people to process them and take them in and um, and then relate to them. I feel like one song I that I I really love um, and that you do this all of what we've been talking about really well. Like you're you're so honest about um, yourself, and then uh, because of that, it's relatable. Is different now, which I think is on your okay. most recent album. Um, could you, do you want to talk a little bit about that song, um, and kind of what you were thinking and, um, why, why you wrote it? Sure. What it means? Sure. The first verse says, you know, the good kid growing up, that was me. I was voted most likely to be a priest, which I was in, in high school in my Catholic school, I was voted most likely to be a priest and I failed everyone. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> it was kind of coming out of a season, just realizing that, um, you know, just a mixture of my own personality and, and uh, the events of my life. Mm -hmm. um, I would say I'm naturally a pretty uh, avoidant person and somebody who uh, would want peace at all costs, but like peace as in like, just like no, no waves. Um, mm -hmm. And through life, realizing that um, sometimes going for like not making any ripples in life, not like not being affected by life and not affecting life actually isn't bringing peace into the world. So it's kind of like hmm. also, I think there's a line in there about um, what I thought it meant to be kind. Um, yeah. Uh, you said my, to, to, like, my definition. Myself. Yeah. My definition of the way to be kind was to lose myself and to shun desire. Yeah. Which and, is, and so, yeah. So like just finding out in life that like, oh, that, yeah. For some reason I had a definition of kind that was like, I need to er erase myself and not be a burden on anybody. Yeah. And then, mm -hmm. you know, you do that long enough and then you realize, well, what happens is you start to build up resentment because you're, you feel like you're being erased. And then, you know, it starts to come out in other ways and that's not actually being kind. So it's, it's taken a lot of, life experience and therapy and spiritual direction, all these kinds of things and my friends, good friends to help me uh, realize that like, Oh, a way to be kind. Sometimes a way to be kind is having boundaries and a way to be mm -hmm. kind is to um, like not be passive aggressive and, and <laughs> actually speak up when you have, like if, if I'm created a certain way to be in the world and I'm like putting a blanket over it for the sake of peace, um, mm -hmm maybe that's not the most peaceful or kind thing to do. So, you know, it's just out of, uh, I don't, I don't know, uh, kind of stating in a place where like all these things that I thought, Oh, this is what it's like to be this. And then, then realizing, Oh, that's not, that's not actually that's true. Not it. Yeah. It made me think, I don't know that first, like I, again, I, I really relate to that first, um, few lines uh, about being like the good kid growing up and, you know, people telling you, you were like, that's, that is definitely my story too. Like being told all the time, Oh, you're so good. Um, and I think that kind of refrain starts to tell you that only your behavior matters, only your, you know, only what you're doing. That's the only thing that people care about. And that's the only thing that makes you valuable. Um, when it's, you know, so much deeper, like if you're doing all the right things, but your heart is wrong or you're resentful or you're um, not standing up for what's true or whatever the case may be, um, 
then there's so many more problems that that's that's where my head was going through yeah. this song and that's a, a you know a great example of how like th- it's speaking to me personally but i just think there's a lot there um when it comes to like kind of trying to prove yourself through mm. what you think you should be doing which i think a lot of times um is like we think we should be acting a certain way and not addressing kind of the the deeper issue of like <laughs> what your heart says and uh, believes and trusts. I don't know. Totally. And I, you know, this is making me think of, um, so over the years, probably because I've been uh, through a lot of counseling, there's a lot of counseling language in my songs. And then a lot of counselors would use my songs and their practices or whatever. And then, you know, hmm. that builds upon itself. And then, uh, these days, like I just got home last night from um, doing this intensive therapy retreat that I do uh, with a ministry out of Colorado a couple times mm-hmm. a year. And there are a lot of weekends where I'm doing, end up doing these intensive therapy weekends where I'm playing a little bit of music, but it's a lot of small group stuff, usually helping uh, guys to try to reconnect with their heart. So mm-hmm. I think one thing I've learned in, in doing that. Um, we do these, you know, experiential exercises of, of like trying to, to dig through childhood trauma and all this kind of stuff. And uh, in one of those exercises, you list out your roles as, a, you know, in your family of origin, kind of from zero to 18 in the house you grew up. And it could be, you know, I was the the comedian or I was the scapegoat or whatever. Well, most of these guys that are coming here, like their lives falling apart because they're, they're disconnected from their heart. I would say Hmm. the most common thing I hear is the good kid, you know, like they were the golden child or the good kid in their family. And, you know, I'm not saying being the good kid means your life is going to fall apart. I think just being a human means your life is probably going to fall apart. But, but when you just seeing that pattern of what happens when your life is like performance based and, it's your job to be the kid that doesn't make waves in your family, or it's your job to like always reflect well upon your family name or, or whatever it is. Um, What happens is like, that's just like fertile ground for hiding and for shame. Anything that, anything that falls short, you want to hide and then you feel shame about it and just covers up. So I'm not saying that's the only way uh, to, to, you know, have a hard time in life. But, um, and the intention I think is good, but the point is coming back to if, if your whole life is performing for other people, then it's, I think it's that much harder to just allow one to even know what your true self is, you know, cause you, mm-hmm. you're presenting something else the whole time. But once you've, you have a hint of what that is, um, being okay, that that's, that's enough, you know, and you don't mm-hmm. have to perform, um, which is, I think, just a lifelong journey, maybe for all of us. Um, yeah. But that's what I think when I think of, you know, when I see guy after guy come to these retreats, and a lot of them are dealing with addictions, and it's like, oh, well, it's, yeah, of course, you're the good kid. That's what happens. You start hiding, and, and the shame takes over, and, and you need to find a coping strategy for the dissonance between who you feel like you have to be and who you feel like you are. And so yeah. in that case, it, it makes a lot of sense. Yeah, that's so... Interesting. And, um, so, I mean, there's a lot there. I feel like that's so cool that you are, get to be a part of, um, ministries like that and, and kind of that your music has been used in therapy in that way. And I would say, you know, um, obviously a common thread and theme that runs through your music in particular is that, um, the reason we can be honest is because of God's grace. Like, he's, his love runs deeper than, um, the things that we mess up at and deeper than our guilt and our shame. Um, which I feel like that, um, another song I was going to ask you about is not too late, which, um, I really love your fault lines album and thank you. This song is on there. Um, but you talk about this, this whole song is just kind of how it's never too late to, to come clean and be honest. Um, because I think you say, what do you, one of the lines at the end is, um, 
death has a strong grip. There's nothing like the power. There's nothing like the power the hand of God can bring. I've been to hell. That's how I can tell you with authority. Um, you say it's not too late to change your mind. It's not too late for the truth this time. Um, and then later, not too late to come clean. Grace is, I love this line, grace is more than a concept to believe in. It's something more real than your beating heart that runs to the depths of where you are. Um, can you talk a little bit about kind of that idea? Because I think that's, even for Christians, is really hard to get a, a grasp on the fact that like grace isn't just a concept. Mm. Um, it's a it's a reality. And I think that that, when we, when we finally see that or we hear that, you know, through preaching or however, it's, it's a very powerful, um, thing to hear. So would love to, to hear a little bit more about that. From you. Yeah, sure. Well, that, that song was written for, uh, a friend who kind of felt like, uh, he had gone too far in some of his life decisions and, and there's no way to come back. You know, he had made too many mistakes and, um, mm -hmm. I often talk about with this song, one thing I love about having community is, is like the people around us can look at our lives from a, from a perspective dis differently than ours. Like it would be like, I'm running through this maze, yeah. this labyrinth and, and like, I, it looks like I'm at a dead end and our community can maybe look down and see, Oh, there's, there's a million ways out of here. Uh, which is, I think hmm. what I was trying to communicate in the song was like, Oh man, this is, you feel like you're, you feel like this is a dead end. And, um, it's not like there, there's so many ways, uh, out of it. And, um, but you know, this song in particular has a special place in my heart. Cause you know, I wrote that for a friend and then, um, there was a season for me that was just kind of like a, a harder season. And, and I felt myself hiding more and more. Yeah. And, um, again, and, and I had to like sing this song over and over again when I was recording it and listening to it, working on the record and, and those lines at the end, um, you know, it's not too late to uh, fall on your knees. It's not too late for apologies. It's not too yeah. late to come clean and face all the fallout that there might be. And I kept listening to that and I was like, oh, that's killing me. Um, <laughs> but like, that's when I say the songs are kind of aspirational. It's like I could listen to this song that I wrote. And I'm not saying it's particularly great or inspired or whatever. It's just a song. But like, yeah, it was what I needed to hear at that moment and to, to remind me like, oh, yeah, this isn't when I think about grace is not just a concept to believe in. It's easy for me to sing about it or to write about it and be like, oh, you know, you're loved no matter what. And you've never gone yeah. too far. It's not too late. It's easy for me to sing about that. But then when it gets into the particulars of my life, I'd be like, yeah, well, that, that doesn't really apply to me. That, it's easy for me to feel that way. It's easy for me to feel like, well, yeah. Or, or for me just to not apply it to my own life. And so mm -hmm. those words were reminding me like, okay, this, the kind of grace that I would give to other people is all, that's available for me too. And I just need to trust it. And um, hmm. I don't know, that's, that's kind of, it's, it's really easy for me to see that in other people. And it's really hard for me to I think it's easier for me to feel it for myself now than it was a long time ago. Um, but yeah. still, it's still not natural. No, uh, no. I think my, I know. I, yeah. I don't think it's anyone's instinct. I think that's why it's so great when it comes through to us through like an outside source, you know, mm -hmm. like whether it's your, your song to someone or, um, you know, through the gospel being like proclaimed because we're not, we're not going to naturally tell ourselves that, but we are going to see, yeah, we're going to see it and feel like it's applied to our neighbor. Mm -hmm. Um, but we never are going to really, I don't know. I would say we're, yeah, we're not really able to, or at the very least, very good at applying it to, to ourselves. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like we're trying to paint something on our face without a mirror. Like it's just going to look real yeah. bad. And I think, so. I think I can accept that that's just going to be reality for the rest of my life, which is why yeah. I need to be in community with people. It's like, mm -hmm. it's, I mean, that's reason one of a million of why I need to be in community with people. But, but if I can accept that, um, in some ways I am 
unable to see that about myself or to believe that about myself. And I hope there's growth in that th for the rest of my life, but I can be okay knowing that yeah. like, yeah, I just, I can't really do that. I can't <laughs> see those places in my life that other people could see. And so it is important that I'm in intentional, honest community with other people who can look at my life and remind me what's true. And I don't mm -hmm. have to feel shame yeah. about not, I can let go of feeling shame about not knowing what's true about myself. I think that's something that people can do if they're yeah. in a performance thing. They can be like, oh, I should have, I've read this before. I know all the words. I know that this should, and they'd be like, oh, there's something wrong with me that I can't get this for myself. I'd be like, no, there's not something wrong with you. That's just, that's kind of a human condition. So I can let go of the shame of it and just be like, accept the, um, mm -hmm. the help and the love from the people around me. Yeah. I think a lot of times, especially Christians struggle with like, well, then what do I do? And it's like, well, then go do that for your neighbor. Like let, let your neighbor do that to, to you and, um, feel, you know, like you said, let go of that shame and, um, have feel the freedom that's within that, but then go and speak that and proclaim that to, to other people. Mm -hmm. Um, if, if you really want something to do, um, then, then there it is. I was going to ask you too. I feel like, uh, you know, a lot of your songs are, are obviously very deep, but you also have a lot of very funny songs and you also have a lot of funny, deep songs, um, which I don't know if that's just what we call irony, but um, why write funny songs? Um, because you have like you have all these very beautiful, thought provoking songs. And I don't want to imply that your funny songs or your humor songs are not thought provoking. They are. Um, but kind of where does that inclination come from for you? Hmm. Um, th well, first, thanks for saying they're funny. Um, <laughs> the, uh, I mean, part of it is also just a reflection of, of hopefully who I am. I mean, I just, I like humor. Yeah. I've always liked, um, I'm not saying that I'm particularly funny, but I, I appreciate, uh, good comics. I appreciate good writers. Um, I just always have. Um, but I think for me that like the, the quote funny songs or whatever you want to call them. Um, one thing about them is whenever I'm writing like a, a humorous song, I, I, there are escape hatches everywhere in case people aren't laughing. I could pretend like I'm seeing them seriously because <laughs> I'm just too nervous to, to put it out there. <laughs> but, um, really for me, those songs are a tool in, in particularly for a mm. live show. Um, so, and the tool would be to like, it just feels like if I could get people laughing about something, then they trust me more with mm. whatever I'm going to say. That's just, maybe that's wrong, but people sometimes say that. And that's what it kind of feels like in the room. If I can get people to let their guard down a little bit. Um, mm. And sometimes that can be in one song, you know, try to like let them get their guard down in the song and then try to bring something that of substance uh, yeah. right behind it. Um, so I, I don't know. I just, if I'm hanging out with people, like if I think of like my, like a, a wonderful evening on my back porch with neighbors or friends or something like that, it would involve laughing really hard and then talking about really uh, deep and personal things, like all those things in one night. Mm. So yeah, to me, it's, it's like, um, I think the laughter and then some songs that could be really dark and really heavy. It's yeah. kind of like, I like to think of it as expanding the window of tolerance of like, of this place where we can mm -hmm. live. Like you can, you can feel all of these things and, um, you know, which is a common criticism of, of what people would say is like contemporary Christian music or, or like Christian music sure. on the radio where the window of tolerance is pretty small. It's like, you don't want to go too sad. Um, it's like, you want to keep it safe. Um, mm -hmm. and that might be true. I don't really care if it's true or not, but, uh, I, I will say for me having, um, being able to play a funny song in a show, I think this is kind of weird, but I feel like it buys me, uh, two or three serious songs after it, where people will be really open to hmm. hearing whatever I have to say. 
Um, so if yeah. there's ever an occasion and there have been some where people are like, oh, will you come play this thing and just play this one particular funny song? I'm like, I don't really like doing that because the whole pur purpose for the funny song is for is to gain a connection with somebody and an opening so that I can yeah. do something else. Um, uh -huh. But then sometimes I'm like, well, the song is what it is. And if people just need to laugh, then that's that's OK. Um, yeah. But personally, I think of it just as a way to connect with people on a more deep that's level. So, that's so interesting. I mean, that makes so much sense, but um, I hadn't really thought about it that way. Do you ever get like negative feedback from being funny in songs? Like, do you think people expect something different sometimes? And There are some places, um, well, I'm part of this Christmas tour we've been doing for 20 something years. And uh, this, oh, wow. This past Christmas, the first half of the tour is just like a number of writers in the round kind of doing their own songs. And I played a show early on in this tour and I wasn't sure. I was like, I don't know I'm going to play tonight. And for some reason, this song, this old song about skinny jeans came to mind. And it's, it's not a great song. People don't need to go listen to it. <laughs> but sometimes people laugh at it. And, um, and for some reason, it, it just came to mind like, I'm going to play that song. So I did. And, you know, people laugh. It seemed like it went over well. And, uh, but apparently at intermission, I went back to the green room and, and the rest of the band guys told me that somebody stormed out of the church after that song, like into the green oh, room no. and was just like really like red faced, angry. And he's like, that song is not funny. That song is not funny. <laughs> and I was like, and he wasn't like a, he wasn't like a hipster wearing skinny jeans. So I don't, I don't think it was like, he felt, I was trying to figure out the whole night, like, why was he so upset? And, um, sometimes people are like, why would you, I don't know if this is why he was upset, but this is what I imagined. Cause I've heard it before. Like, why would you play a song like that in a church that has no oh, talk about God? It's just like, <laughs> it, it was just making people laugh and kind of telling a story laugh. and it, it didn't have yeah. like a pre presentation of the gospel or there was no, yeah. yeah. I've heard people say that, I mean, very few people say that, but like, feel like, oh, this church is a holy place. Why are you playing something like that? And for me, I feel oh. pretty strongly like, oh, it, it totally belongs there. But I get that, him feeling that way. Um, but if I have any kind of negative feedback, it's it, which it doesn't happen a whole lot because the places that wouldn't like me to do that have pretty much weeded me out at this point in my career. So people that okay. have me come, they kind of know what I do. Um, and they're kind of hoping that I do that. Um, but I think that would be, you know, this, this feeling that like in a sacred space, we shouldn't be hmm. joking around. And I just happen to feel differently. I'm like, I think yeah, that's okay with it. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I agree. I, um, I don't know if this is the, the right story because I wasn't there, but I'm going to tell it anyway. My husband was at a funeral on Friday um, for, um, a church member. And he said he was talking about the, the sermon that was given by our pastor. And I guess that our pastor said something along the lines of there are two truths in, um, in death for the Christian, um, which, you know, of course one is that it's sad and it's not right and it's not natural and we mourn and we grieve. Um, but the other truth is that, um, we rejoice and we have, we have hope that we will see this person again. And he was, he then, I guess, told the story about planning the funeral with this, uh, particular family, which is a really large family at our church. And there was like a lot of laughter as they were telling stories about their mom. And, um, they were just like cracking up in his office. And he said something like it, a lot of people might have walked by and, been like, why are they laughing while they're planning this funeral? Like that seems so wrong. Um, but there's like a place for it because of this underlying hope. I don't know that, that just made me kind of think of oh, that. Yeah. Like there is a place for humor and relatability. Um, if, if there's not a place for it in church, I don't know where there is a place for it right. because we kind of have freedom to do that because of the hope that we have in Christ. So I, I totally agree with you there. Yeah. And I, I kind of, I don't know. I, I, I believe there are some people at their funerals, they would probably be really offended if people were laughing. 
you know, that and maybe that's yeah. just out of their own life experience and kind of what they value. Mm-hmm. But when I think about my yeah. funeral, I hope people are laughing their butts off. I hope people are telling funny stories and, uh, and I hope they're, mm-hmm. I hope they're laughing more than they are crying, but I hope they cry too. Yeah. I hope, I hope there's a little bit of both, but, um, I, I just like the idea mm-hmm. of having, um, well, I remember being at a, a conference years ago that we were, I was playing at and there was a filmmaker there. He's a Christian filmmaker and he just kind of talked about Christian film and he was talking about, <laughs> um, he didn't do like, like Kirk Cameron Christian films or whatever, but he, he's a Christian who did films and he was just talking about like people were kind of upset that some of his movies were rated R and had some rough things in them. And he was just, just saying like, well, I kind of think in a movie when you feel the rede- the redemption is only, um, well, the, the, uh, the glory is only as deep as the depravity, the redemption is only as, as, yeah. as deep. And so like, he's not trying to do a lot of gratuitous stuff, but he's just saying like, if we paint a picture where like, Oh, the hard time that I went through was that I, you know, missed quiet time three days in a row. Then the redemption for that is just kind of like, okay, like whatever. <laughs> right. But if you can get into yeah. kind of the really hard parts, then the redemption feels like so much, so much more deep. And so I don't mm. know that that's back to that window of tolerance thing where, um, I kind of think I would hope in a show, if somebody came to hear me play for two hours, um, they would feel like life has expanded a little bit, you know, where, yeah. where you have permission to feel all kinds of ways, which is funny coming from mm. somebody who I said, is not really connected with my own emotions, but <laughs> so maybe that's a selfish right. thing. Maybe I want to expand that in my, my own self. Yeah. No, I, I love that. I think that that's a beautiful way to look at it. And I think humor gets us there um, in a lot of ways because it's so, – oh, a lot of times it seems like it's – things are funny because they shouldn't be said. Mm-hmm. Like you're saying things that everyone is like, oh, my gosh, yes, like about skinny jeans or the Enneagram or whatever um, that are just not being said anywhere else. And that's why – that's what makes it so – funny. Um, and, but it takes, it takes courage to say that. And it takes, I think some honesty to be able to do that. And that is, I think something that is missing a lot of times from normal, typical Christian music. I feel like one song, this might be a weird song to bring up, but, uh, I, I don't know. I, I really like it because it's like a mix of you being funny, but also kind of, (laughs) profound and also you're like telling some personal stories so it's like a mix of to me everything that you do um it's the song too real and the first i'm gonna just oh is it uh, is it real the first wait is it is it real or too real oh yeah is it real you're right you wrote the song um yeah is it real and it um starts with there's a man who looks like donald trump in front of me in the communion line I know that I'm supposed to keep my mind on better things, but his hair looks like a helmet of gold put on by a three-year-old. Nothing makes it move. And so I can't help wondering, is it real? Is it real? Which is your chorus. And then you have, uh, I think, two or three more verses that are a lot more serious and kind of get to some like theological truths. Can you talk talk us through kind of that song and that mix of... Um, of feelings and approaches within that one song. Sure. Um, I guess first off, I would say this is an example of, you know, the structure that I talked about. Um, yeah, this is, this is an example of me just kind of leaning on the structure to bring meaning out of it. So like I didn't start out with an idea of writing a song about anything in particular. The song Mm. started just literally I was, uh, I have three kids and they're, you know, older now. I got two in college and one in high school, but, uh, this is long ago. This is pre, uh, well, when the idea of Donald Trump being a president would, would have been, would have been funny, uh, like a long yeah. time ago. Um, and, uh, so I was putting the kids to bed and I was just kind of carrying around this guitar and kind of singing from room to room, whatever. I don't do that all the time. Um, but <laughs> I was trying to make my daughter laugh. So I was just playing some random chords and I was trying to make her laugh. So I just kind of, that first verse was 
just whatever came out. There's a man who looks like Donald Trump in front of me in the communion line. And then when I got to, is it real part? I was like, well, that's weird. And then, uh, then uh, as I was walking back and forth, I was like, what? Like, what does that mean? Like, why, why did I, why did my mind go there? And why did I write that? And I was like, well, I don't know. Let's just follow the form. So I kind of trusted the mm. form of the song. And so since I was talking about communion line, I was like, well, what do I think of the communion? And I thought about my first communion, you know, in my Catholic school growing up. And uh, there was a guy named Sam who was blind that I was kind of leading up to the, so it's just kind of like, it made me think of this story when I got my first communion at church. And, um, and then at the end of that verse gets to, you know, we get up there and, and um, he just kind of stuck his tongue out and they, they put the, the wafer on his tongue. And for me, I took it. I'm sorry, but that's like, that's an amazing first communion story. Like to begin with that you, you had a friend that was blind that you had to lead. And then they put like, that's, there's so many things there that are amazing. It is. And it's like, I don't have a lot of memories of my childhood, but I remember that. I I, I still remember him with his right hand. He was hitting the side of every pew kind of saying doodle, doodle, doodle. And then he he hit somebody's arm. He goes, oops, you know, whatever. And then we get up there and get communion. Wow. And so the structure of it, I was like, oh, if I'm writing a funny song, I kind of wrote, I mean, funny in quotes, but like, you know, it's funny just because like saying something about Donald Trump and his hair is right. People are like, oh, that's it's funny. They laugh. Yeah. And so then structure wise, I go to the second verse. I'm like, well, I don't want to like totally depart um, the humor part. So, but I don't want it to be just humor. So that the very end, I talk about like, the drinking the blood and then saying, is it real? Mm-hmm. And and at that point, that's not like really funny, but at that point performing the song, some people laugh and some people don't. Uh, it doesn't really matter if they do, but it's kind of like moving to like, not as funny, but still lighthearted. Um, yeah. And then um, it goes to this bridge about um, that, you know, as I was going from my daughter's room to my older son's room, and at, around that time, I was literally reading this book with my oldest son that was given to us by at some conference we played at. You know, it's like it wasn't focused on the family, but I think it was something like that. And um, mm. and it was like how to raise your teenage boy. I don't, I don't know what the name of the book was, but it was like talking to your teenage boys about whatever. And so we started mm. reading this book together. And um, I was like, yeah, I don't know if I agree with everything that's in this book, but let's just see what it says. And we were reading it. Mm -hmm. And we literally got to this second chapter and the author said, I know that it's easy to believe in God. And my son was like, dad, it's not easy. He said, I want to burn this book. And I was like, okay, let's get rid of this book. (laughs) You know? And so for some reason, the only reason why I thought of that is because I was walking back and forth in the, the kids' rooms. And, and so it, you know, starting with a stupid idea about Donald Trump and the communion line, it just became this song about, uh, this mixture of my own doubt and what it meant to uh, go and take communion. Um, so yeah. I really had very little control over where the song was going to go. I just kind of followed the structure. And so mm-hmm. in each verse felt like it gave me a clue to the next thing. And then, you know, at the end, it just talks about showing up on Sunday and kneeling down to get communion, whether it's a habit, you know, some days maybe I mean it more than others, or maybe I'm more connected, but I'm still asking that question. Um, you know, is it real? I'm still showing up. I don't know if that really yeah. answers your, your question about no. it, but that I, was, what, that was a, a journey from beginning to end where I really had no clue where it was going to go. And it just started because I was bored and trying to make my daughter laugh. <laughs> I love that. Well, and it is like, it's kind of, to me, it seems like it's, uh, this song in particular is what you were just talking about as far as like using humor as an entry point for people. Cause the song itself like starts funny and probably perks people's ears up. And then you get to a place that's really, really interesting. Um, and all along you're asking this, this same question, but the question, the, the answer to the question kind of changes or maybe the meaning to the answer of, is it real kind of changes. So I, I really like it. Thank you. It's cool. Yeah, I'm a sucker for yeah. that. I mean, talking about song structure, I'm a sucker for a kind of song where I can get to a chorus. I can have people look at a chorus, you know, two or three different ways by the end of the song. Like you like yeah. set it up to where you're looking at it this way. And that's just, that's like you know, old country music tricks 
you know, but it, yeah, those tricks always worked on me. So I always loved them. I feel like your, your writing, like we've said, kind of gets to the human condition either through humor or, you know, something that's a little bit more serious and honest. Um, but you are also a lot of times and maybe even all the time when it's necessary, leaving people with grace and the gospel. Would you say that's like a storytelling? Um, do you feel like that's important for storytelling when it comes to your your music and what you're trying to do to always end on um, grace? Is that like a goal of yours or does it just kind of tend to happen naturally for you? Hmm. Well, I, I kind of, I feel like if there's an intention, it's this weird mixture of always wanting to, um, I don't know, there, there are a lot of uh, intentions that kind of go, I guess, into every song, you know, people who say yeah. that pastors only have one sermon, they preach their whole life and a songwriter might have only one song they sing their whole life. And mm. I kind of think that's true. And, and if, if it's true for me, the song would be uh, wanting people to, uh, feel like they're not alone, but also like that they, um, they don't have to, they're loved the way they are, you know? So mm. but there's also, I'm also intentional in not trying to like, every song doesn't have to tie up into that space, you know? So it's, it's like, yeah, we can talk about hard things and don't have to put a, a bow on it. But, um, but I just really believe like my experience in, in this life um, has been that every turn that I thought um, I would have to hide my brokenness or my failures. Um, like I have every time where I thought I would be met with death, hmm. I was met with life uh, beyond anything that I had imagined before. Like anytime I thought hmm. like, Oh, if this happens, this is it. And then like, I find out that I'm a really bad predictor of the future uh, because I keep thinking that that's just going to be, you know, horrible. If people were to see some weakness or if, if I were to be seen as stupid or whatever. And then, you know, enough times of, of experiencing failure or um, like really learning that like those broken parts inside of me are things that like, are bridges to connect with other people and are bridges to understanding more about myself. Um, so like, that's just been my overwhelming experience in life. So it's, yeah, it's like that the grace, um, whatever that looks like, if it just looks like saying, no matter what you've been through, uh, you're loved. Uh, that's like a mm. huge, magnet it's, it's like a sun that, that everything is kind of like revolving around it and some songs get closer to it than others uh but it's just like they're they're all they're all kind of held by that truth because i just feel like that's the way my life has been held so i don't know another way to write no i think that that's um i think that's really beautiful and i certainly think it's you know personally i would say that's a helpful place to leave people uh whether it's in a song or theologically, you know, if we're just talking about like the goal of, of, of a preacher or whatever. Um, so I think that the fact that you can, that you are doing both so well, like you're kind of cutting away at, um, what's hard for people and what's difficult about life and where we mess up through honesty and humor, but then leaving people with, um, with a word that doesn't leave them alone in that I think is really beautiful um, and important. So Thank you, yeah, Kelsey. that's, that's great. Yeah. Well, um, I know you're working on a new album. Can you tell us a little bit about what you're working on, whether it's that or something else uh, before we wrap up? Sure. Yeah. I've, I've kind of quote been working on a record for a, a while now. Like I think the last record I had was like 2018, which is, that's a long time now. Uh, and I probably should have been doing records during COVID time, but it just, I couldn't do it. Um, so yeah. there are a lot of songs that I've written in the last number of years that, you know, I've been playing out on the road and, um, that I'm excited about getting out. So I'm, 
I am, uh, I've been working on that here and, but the problem is I'm traveling a lot. So it's, it's really hard for me to switch gears from, uh, mm-hmm. you know, if I'm gone from Wednesday to Sunday and I'm home for two or three days. Then I'm like, I, w- I want to like see my community more than I want to like make a record. So, um, yeah, but I'm, so I'm slowly chipping away at it and, um, yeah, I'm just excited to have those songs out there. And in the meantime, what I've done is, uh, people talked to me for a while about doing a Patreon thing. I was like, oh, that just sounds like too much work. I, I can't do it. Um, but what I've done instead is, is like to give these songs a place to live in the meantime. Um, I kind of did a Patreon thing where whenever I write a song, I just take a, I make a video of it and post it so people can engage in the songs. And if they're looking for those songs, they can find them there. And, and I can kind of get feedback about it from the, the wonderful community that's there. So the songs kind of, hmm. there's a lot of songs, you know, like, I don't know, 80 to a hundred songs that kind of live there. Oh, wow. In the meantime, while I'm working on this particular record and trying to narrow down, you know, uh, all the songs Wait, that are going to be on it. there, but I'm really excited and it yeah. should be done. Uh, well, the hope is that I would be able to do it this between now and like April, uh, finish recording stuff. So, okay. Yeah. Awesome. Oh, well that's not too far. Well, away. I say that, but you know, oh. anybody who knows me like, Oh yeah, you said <laughs> that before. So we'll, we'll see. <laughs> okay. Well, that's great. People can kind of be on the lookout for that. Anything else, any, any place that people should be, should go to, to find your stuff, whether it's like social media or sure, yeah. Like on, I mean, I'm on social media, like, I mean, I'm like Instagram and Facebook and people are still on there. And then my website is just Andy But, um, I'm horrible at, at, uh, posting a lot because I, I don't know, part of it's like, I love my actual life. Much. You know, so I, I, yeah. I find that whenever I get into the mode of feeling like I need to post a lot, then I, then I like, I don't like where it takes me. Um, so you yeah. can follow me on there, but I'm also like just easy to get in touch with if anybody wants to get in touch with me. I don't have people, uh, but through, you know, through social media or through Patreon, that's kind of like where it's just patreon.com uh, slash Andy Gullihorn. That's kind of where, uh, the most, um, updated i mean it's where i'm putting all the songs and and kind of conversations about that and go to the website i, th- I think that's it's great. still up there i don't really check it that's not very helpful <laughs> is it no. people will find you yeah it's sure. fine Come find me. all right thanks so much andy i appreciate your time thank you kelsey outside yourselves is a 1517 podcast to learn more about all of our shows and all of our podcasts please go to 1517.org forward slash podcasts we have a new academy course out now led by Bruce Hillman who's been on the show in this academy course which is free to anyone who enrolls Bruce is leading us through the history of the church fathers who these people were and why they are important to the church and important to us today so make sure you go and check that out and sign up for it if you haven't done so already if you haven't done this already i would love if you could give outside ourselves a five-star rating wherever you're listening leave us a written comment it should only take you a minute or two or if you're watching and listening on youtube please go ahead and subscribe those are all easy ways to get the word out about the show and to support what i am doing here thanks as always for listening i'll be back here in a couple weeks with our next guest